Welcome to Engaging Truth. This is your host for this evening, and I have once again a dear friend of mine who's um, who really was instrumental in and bringing and encouraging me to become a clergyman in the church body in which I am today. So I want to say thank you. A long time ago, you offered that encouragement. In fact, it was more than encouragement, if you remember. Uh, I think you said, it's about time you make a decision to do something. Did I use any guilt to move you to do what you I, did? As I recall, it was some kind of guilt, but well, it wasn't bad guilt. I've been, known, was... I've been known to cause people <laughs> to feel guilty and take a little action. Our guest for this evening is Dr. Jerry Kieschnick. Um Pastor Jerry, what is your position today? It is no longer what you were. It's different uh, in the Texas district of the LCMS. Actually, I serve as chief executive officer of a ministry called Legacy Deo, D-E-O, Legacy of God, Legacy from God, Legacy to God. And we, but we are basically involved in helping people make gifts to their family and to church organizations or church ministries of their choice. Current gifts, deferred gifts, planned gifts, estate gifts, legacy gifts. I did this work 30 years ago, and at the time I had to leave that to go do the ecclesiastical supervision thing as a district president. I said, someday, if I ever wash out of that business, I'd like to go back and talk to people about dying and giving and taxing again. And the opportunity arose, so that's what I do professionally. I do that work on a full-time basis. But I serve on a number of other boards of organizations that are parachurch organizations that do mission work and support pastors and, and coach pastors. You still do a lot of traveling, though. Yes, I do a fair amount of traveling. I, I'm invited to preach in different states of the nation occasionally, but most of my work is here in Texas. I go to churches and I talk and preach and teach about stewardship or generosity, as we're calling it today, and about the privilege and responsibility of Christian people to be good managers of the financial resources that God entrusts to our care. We have, as a church, um, come from Europe years ago, back in the 1700s and 1800s. Um, our church fathers uh, and our grandfathers and great-grandfathers left Germany for a reason. They really wanted to come to America and say, we want to establish uh, our walk of faith and life in the lives of children and adults. And so with that was the creation, as I recall it in my reading of Christian schools to begin with. That's really the very bottom stone, the, the, um, the, the sole underpinning of our church today. But the culture has changed from that particular time to today. Would you describe, as you go back into history, what that looked like then as you have read it and studied it and how that compares with today? I'm glad you prefaced that by saying as I've read it and studied it, not as I've lived it, because I'm old but not that old. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll go back to my own family history. My great, 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 great grandfather is as far back as I can trace my history. His name was Kishnik, just like mine, but his first name was Johan. And he lived in what we consider now East Germany, but it was a community of Wends, the Wends, W-E-N-D-S, Wendish people who were basically a Slavic people. They're, the language is nothing like German. It's more nearly Polish or Czechoslovakian. But he, he never came to America, but his son, my great-great-great-grandfather, and his son, my great-great-grandfather, got on the boat, the Ben Nevis, and came over here in 1854. They landed in Galveston, and I think they rented or bought some oxen and some carts and took all of their property, the stuff that they had carried on the boat over here from Germany, and they started moving inward, you know, moving toward, uh, away from the coast of Texas, and they ended up stopping at a place called, what we call it now, Lee County. It's uh, Serbin, S-E-R-B-I-N is the town, which is the place where they basically settled, and they the first thing they did was build a church, and the church is still standing, still operating, still an active congregation, St. Paul Lutheran Church in Serban. And from there, people just sort of began to migrate to different parts of the state of Texas, and they, they took their faith with them. 
And the faith they took is partly, not exclusively as I understand it historically, but partly a, a good part of the reason they left their home, their family, their farms, their heritage, their place of birth, their churches in Germany. They left all that behind and got on this boat for a three-month ride plagued by cholera and people dying on board and being buried at sea. And one of the three ships in the Armada ended up sinking and all the people drowned. I mean, there this serious deal to make that decision to, to leave and go to an unknown destination. So the, the deal was the king of Prussia in those days made the proclamation that the people in Germany should form a united church. It was to be a combination of the Reformed Church and the Lutheran Church. And Lutheran people said, I don't think so, Mr. King. They probably didn't say it to his face, but they said it, they voted with their feet. And they ended up saying, we can't live this way. We're going to go to a new land, a new country, where we can have a, a, the right, a freedom to express our faith in the way we want to, not in the way a king tells us we need to. So as people moved from Lee County, Serban area, to different parts of the state, gradually, one by one, churches started getting formed. And one of them is right here in this area, Tomball. Salem Lutheran Church in Tomball is an old congregation, but it is, is really made a, an incredible transformation in a, a culture that's certainly different today than it was when it was formed. So the... The culture, let me talk about the culture. Back in, in the days when my relatives, my ancestors came to America, I, I sort of define what I understand the culture was in those days as a heterodox Christian culture. And what I mean by that is, generally speaking, most people in America, especially the immigrants, already were believers. They were Christian people. So it was they formed a Christian culture here in America. But not everybody who came over was a Lutheran Christian. We had other expressions of the Christian faith who immigrated to our country. So when I talk about a heterodox Christian culture, I'm talking about a culture where most of the people in our country claimed to be Christian, but they were not all Lutheran. And we Lutherans are a little bit... Uh, persnickety about things like doctrine and while, while I sh surely hope we don't do it in a, a self-aggrandizing way or in a, an inappropriately critical way we call ourselves orthodox orthodox means right teaching and we considered especially in those days other Christian expressions as heterodox that means other teaching so when my ancestors came here, heterodox Christian culture. Everybody's Christian, but different expressions of Christianity. Today, we live in a culture which I would describe as one which is at best indifferent and at worst outright, downright hostile toward the Christian faith and expressions of the Christian faith. And one of the greatest challenges I think we face in the church today is shifting gears and, and remaining faithful Christian people who believe what the Holy Scriptures say about God and, it, and who he is and what he's done and how he interacts with people today and, and, the, and the forgiveness of sin and salvation that come through faith in Christ we still retain that, and I pray to God we will never lose that. So how do we communicate that in a culture that's not all Christian, but, as I mentioned a minute ago, somewhat resistant to, critical of, or downright hostile toward the Christian faith? One illustration that I just kind of stumbled on several years ago that, that just stuck in my mind, I was invited while... Terry and my wife and I were still living in St. Louis when I was serving as president of our national church body, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. I received an invitation to come down to the city of Wahlberg, Texas. Well, there's a Wahlberg, Germany, 
And the people who settled in Wahlberg, Texas, came from Wahlberg, Germany. And they named the town in Texas Wahlberg, Texas, W-A-L-B-U-R-G. So I was invited to preach at the 100 and maybe 125th anniversary of Zion Lutheran Church in Wahlberg, Texas. That's where Terry and I now belong. We're members of that congregation, but we weren't then. So I did a little research before preaching, and I, I found that the church was started in, I believe it was 1880, which is about 137 years ago. And it was founded by a pastor who came from the Lee County area to Wahlberg just occasionally. He still lived in Lee County, but he came up to Wahlberg. And he, his mission was to find all the German Lutherans he could find. That's how he did his mission work. He didn't try to find heathen non-believers and convert them to Christianity because there were no heathen unbelieving people in Wahlberg. They were all Christian people. So he gathered the German Lutheran people and probably had Bible studies and maybe some informal worship services. And, and finally, after a period of time, sort of formed them into a congregation, Zion Lutheran Church. And on the day that that church began, this is what he told the, the German Lutherans who gathered. The greatest enemy we have to face is German Methodism. And when I first read that in the history of the church, I said, excuse me, <laughs> say what? The greatest enemy we have to face is German Methodism? I shouldn't sound like I'm criticizing because probably in that year, 1880, it probably was the greatest enemy the, Germans Lutheran had, the German Lutherans had to face was probably the German Methodists. Well, I would submit that while today Lutherans may have and do have still some differences with our Methodist Christian friends, the reality is I don't believe the, the German or any Methodist church is our greatest enemy today. How about Islam, Hinduism? Mormonism, narcissism, Gnosticism, atheism, the, the devil, the temptations of the world, our sinful flesh, those are the greatest enemies we face in the church today. So how do we, people who live in a, a totally different culture, it's, it's not predominantly Christian, just different expressions of Christianity, it's hostility toward the Christian faith. How do we represent the God of the scriptures and the God in whom we believe, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the kind of culture we face today, which is basically fixated on issues like, you name it, fill in the blank, issues like same gender marriage, gender confusion, disintegration of the family, in the midst of all kinds of demonstrations of man's uh, inhumanity to man with the mass killings going on in cities around the world. Some of those are suicidal. Some of them are shootings like most recently in Las Vegas. How, do, how are we to be the church in that kind of culture, which is, is just rampant with, with the, all those threats, and not to mention the proliferation of non-Christian religions and the, the prevalence of ISIS and other, other radical terrorism acts that, that go on all the time. How, how are we to be the church in the midst of that kind of culture? That's a challenge. Let's talk about the challenges in just a minute. Let me just give you a little bit of PR about who we are. This is Evangelical Life Ministries, and... Um, we create all the programs that come through us, and they're entitled Engaging Truth Programs. And we have guests from all over the state of Texas, all over the country, and some even from other parts of the world. But we'd like to remind you that this program today with our guest, Dr. Kishnick, is a listener-supported program. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and all of our hosts are volunteers. Your donations help us to keep our programs on the air. And so you can go to our website, elmhouston.org, to donate online, or you can send your support to, and I'll give you the address, ELM PO Box 568 Cypress, Texas 77410. 
Also on our website, elmhouston.org, you can access podcasts of past Engaging Truth programs or use the contact tab to ask us a question, comment on our programming, even submit a prayer request, which we receive almost weekly. Now, from the website, you can also jump to the Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube pages and enjoy what God has called us to do. Brother Jerry, you've talked about the challenges that we face, uh, or just introduced them. Let's talk about the challenges and what we do with them. Well, for years, both as an ecclesiastical church body leader, but also before that as a parish pastor, I used to say, and I still say it today, that that the the expression of the challenge of of how to proclaim the gospel to the world in a different culture than the culture in which the church was formed is is manifested in making decisions and choosing uh, devising plans or strategies to to take the mission and the message of the church outside the walls of the church because in in the old days I used to do this as a parish pastor that we had a marquee on the outside of our church and I'd say visitors welcome and lo and behold visitors came today you put a sign and most churches don't have a sign that says visitors welcome because they know that that ain't gonna that that dog won't hunt they're not gonna get many visitors coming in just because the sign says visitors welcome so how do we figure out a way to to take what the the church has to say to the condition of people in the world today outside the church to meet people where they are it's interesting i saw on a, a newsletter that came from our texas district lutheran church i think just last week it was a story about one of our pastors in the austin area who is is in the the heart of austin and he decided to to take one small step that might sort of bring the idea to people in the community that the church is there to serve them. So he he took the concept of Charlie Brown's Lucy, who used to have that little storefront mm-hmm. that said the, the psychiatrist is in. Well, he, he kind of replicated that storefront, put it outside his church, out on the yard, and he said, the pastor is in. So you picture kind of a wall and a little cutout in the wall, and the pastor is sitting there with a sign below it that says the pastor is in. And he goes out there during his lunch hour. And the story that I read, <clears throat> the article I read, reported that, that he had some people that stopped by and engaged in conversation with him. Uh, did he thump his Bible and tell those people that they were going to go to hell if they didn't repent? No, not in those words and not in just a brief outside conversation. But that's one illustration where this guy in a creative way said, we're going to take the church outside to where the people are. There are many other expressions of that where Christian people get involved in ministries of service, ministries of human care, love, and concern for people, and in flood recovery. I mean, here in Houston with Harvey and in other places where natural disasters occur, the church is there. Our own church body is, is there. We're here, right here, both national church and district church, and we're responding, and, and people have had their homes mucked out by Lutheran Christian people, and they've had sheetrock and insulation torn out of the homes because they've got to dry out the studs. And, and all those things are done in the name of Christ by Lutheran Christian people. And some of our churches are receiving one church here, Salem Lutheran Church in Tomball and Trinity Lutheran Church in, in Spring or Klein. They're working together with other congregations in the area, and they've, they've got the use of a 40,000-square-foot warehouse I saw a picture of it today. They just got a load today of sheetrock. And that sheetrock is being stored in the warehouse until it's ready to be installed in people's homes. So there there are ways that demonstrate the love of Christ for our fellow man and woman, for people who are in different stages of need or prosperity, 
but particularly at this time in stages of need and, and do so as serving as the hands and feet of Christ. It should be the natural reaction, should it not be, uh, at the end of the passage which you recorded or spoken before, uh, by grace we are saved through faith. The last verse of that says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God before has ordained that we should follow in them. And I don't think that sometimes we see the passion or the hurt on people's lives that really drives us to do that. You want to comment on that for a moment? Yeah, in times of disaster, in times of human need, I think the church can respond and is at its best. And it's not just the church, it's people in the church. Actually, I preached at a church in the Dallas area this past weekend, and the pastor there at the conclusion of the service said, you know, here at Concordia Lutheran Church in Bedford, Texas, we don't say we go to church, and then everybody spontaneously responded, we are the church. And I thought, that how cool is that? It's simple, but it's a reminder that the people use to remind each other every day that we don't just come to church, we are the church. And when we leave this church, often there are signs on the parking lots of churches that say, you are now entering the mission field. Well, that's true. People who are the church are entering the mission field when they go home to their homes and to their their vocations and to their schools and to their neighborhoods. And we have the opportunity to be the hands and feet of Christ to our neighbors where we live. Sometimes it's hard for our people, our Christian people, wherever they are, not necessarily just in our church body, but in other church bodies. They see an apathy within their own church and they want to do something. Um, what would you, what encouragement would you give to them? You can't just split from there and go to someplace else that's helping. What would you encouragement would you give them? Oh, look around and see the need that exists around you. Our own grandson, Colby. Colby is a 23-year-old young man. He spent three weekends in Victoria with an organization down there, a Christian organization, helping people do the kind of things I just, just talked about. And he, they cut down trees that were falling in the, on people's homes, and, and he just... He wore himself out. He was dog tired when he got through, but he saw the need. It was 100 miles away, but he got in his car at his own expense and drove down there and spent the weekend, three weekends in a row, just helping people. He didn't know. He may never see them again, but they did it in the name of Christ. So look around, see what the need is, respond to that need, and do so as a Christian person, doing the thing that Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 talks about. We're created for good works. To serve others in the precious name of Christ. Brother Jerry, we got 30 seconds left. Would you close us with a prayer? I will. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and for this medium of <clears throat> the broadcast medium where we are able to speak to people and communi com communicate to people that we will never see or know. Fill them and us with the power and presence of your Spirit as we live our lives to your glory every day. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. Come back to be with us again on Engaging Truth, and good night. <laughs>